Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Finn Locustain, the Chief Executive of Farmwell, and welcome to our Round the World Tour of Regenerative Dairy. I'm thrilled to be hosting this opportunity to circumnavigate the globe with four very different regenerative dairy farmers, all of whom are quite exceptional in their own way. We'll be taking a whistle-stop tour of regenerative dairy in the UK, Germany, the USA and New Zealand, and following the conversation, which will probably take around 40 minutes, there'll be a Q&A, so please Please do put questions in the chat box and feel free to introduce yourselves and make comments as we go, as I can see you already are. So this Round the World Tour is part of the Regen Dairy Project, which was set up by FAI Farms and Farmwell in collaboration with Arla Foods, Barry Calibo, Ben & Jerry's, Unilever and Woolworth South Africa. Through this project, we aim to define what regenerative dairy looks like from the bottom up and throughout dairy supply chains and to engage dairy farmers and food businesses around a practical vision for a productive and profitable global dairy sector that also restores its relationship with nature. So to our guests, uh, Blake Alexander is a fourth generation dairy farmer from Alexander Family Farm near Crescent City, California, USA. Richard Park is from Sizer Farm near Kendall in the UK, which is has probably been farmed since the Vikings colonized Britain, uh, probably 1100 years ago, I think is, is how far back the records go. Uh, perhaps Richard can, uh, can, can clarify that as we go forward. Mark Anderson is a fifth generation <laughs> farmer from South Otago, New Zealand. And Annabelle Girard is a first generation dairy farmer from Lower Saxony in Germany. And I'm so grateful that she's joined us because of course English is a second language for her. And she has, you know, she's, she's worked really hard to, uh, to make sure that she's able to join us and take part this evening. So welcome everybody, thanks for being here. Could we start perhaps with just a one minute introduction to your farms please? And I mean kind of farm size, herd numbers, breed, yield, climate and what products you sell. And Blake, could you perhaps start us off? Sure, um, yeah, coming from uh, extreme Northern California, kind of the, the most Western point in the continental United States and uh, very cool season climate here where we, um, we've been grazing cattle for, uh, well, four generations uh, in my family. And uh, we actually manage about 9,000 acres and about 9,000 head of cattle. So half of those are mature uh, organic dairy cows. And we milk on five different farms. Uh, we own all the farms. Uh, it's my wife, Stephanie, and I, and our five grown children are uh, mostly part of the business. Our oldest three are married and all work full time for us. And um, we, we've launched our own brand about five years ago and sell fluid milk um, in around the United States. And we've also make some yogurt and as well as kefir coming, uh, a drinkable yogurt type. And um, you know, we, we, we've been regenerative for about two years and uh, organic for more than 20. Fantastic. And am I right that your farms uh, at, the, at the extreme are about 200 miles apart, but they're all sort of run by different different parts of your family? And, yes. And one, sorry, I was going to say one of those uh, one of those farms is fully um, grass fed cattle. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So um, we, we are I just I just drove the, uh, it's about a hundred miles between two hours or so, two and a half hour drive. And, and so I'm now down in the uh, Southern, Southern County where uh, we do milk um, about 300 cows uh, with hundred percent grass fed. And we're also converting another uh, 700 into that program. We, we find that that market is growing and, and consumers really uh, appreciate that and, and are wanting more of it. Fantastic. Richard, could you tell us about your farm? Yeah. So, uh, my farm is in the northwest of England, and um, we've been here for just over 40 years. My parents came here 40 years ago. The farm is uh, leased or rented from the National Trust, which is a, a UK a charity that owns a lot of uh, historic buildings and land. Uh, we milk 170 uh, crossbred cows. We are on um, about uh, 380 acres, 155 hectares. Uh, about uh, 45 meters, 144 feet above sea level. Uh, we get about 55 inches of rain, about 1400 millimeters. So we're in an um, extremely good area for uh, growing grass and uh, we utilize that with the cows. We've been uh, 
on and off organic for the last 15 years. Um, I guess the regenerative journey probably the last four years. Um, yeah, fam family farm. Um, yeah. Lovely. And just to put that wetness in context, Cumbria is probably one of the wettest parts of the UK. Would that be fair? Uh, that would be correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you. Annabelle, could you tell us a bit about your farm? <clears throat> yes. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so our farm is located in the north of Germany. It's called Hoftangsiel. And we farm about 300 acres, 200 of them are grassland and 100 acre are arable land. And I'm not alone. We are a group of six people. We are farming together. And 10 years ago, we leased this farm from a nonprofit organization. So our goal was to produce regional and sustainable organic food. And so we, we developed the farm with dairy, with our own creamery, with big beef and pork production, with eggs um, and uh, a lot of varieties of vegetables. So within this context, we have a herd of 30 cows, 30 milking cows that contains of 25 milking cows and five nurses. So um, we keep all the calves at the farm and all together we have around 100 heads of cattle. So we raise and finish them by grass. And um, because from the beginning, we were searching for uh, genetics that fit to our circumstances. Um, our herd is really uh, mixed. So we have Holstein Friesian and old German Friesian. We have brown Swiss and old brown cattle. And we have mixtures out of this. Our yield is around 5,000 liters milk per year per cow and the climate is um, yes it's it's continental so we have uh, hot summers cold winters and we can have periods of drought and less rainfall in the spring in the summer in the autumn and in the winter so we have 650 millimeters of rainfall but it's really unsecure when it will come or if it will come so Yes, and the average temperature is around eight degrees. And that's that's really interesting to compare that, isn't it, with, with Richard's rainfall? It's it's significantly <laughs> less, I think. And and Mark, just last but not least, could you tell us about you know your farm in New Zealand? Thanks, Finlo. Um, I'm Mark Anderson, and we farm near the bottom of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and we steward around fifteen hundred acres, and through the generations, the farm has moved from a smaller, diverse land holding to what it is now a larger monoculture milking 620 cows today. Um, for the last five years, we've bred away from the traditional uh, Frisian, New Zealand Frisian, towards Normandy and Fleckvi. Um, and the focus there has been on the dual purpose animals with with um, superior foraging capabilities and and that will be a low input animal um, with and a good fit for our our mob grazing and our once a day milking system uh, we received we dry land so we we receive around seven to eight hundred mils of rain annually and we're very greedy and so we like to capture all that rain in our soil and not give it away so yeah, focusing on soil health is a big one for us. Um, and our pasture yields are somewhere around that 11 tonnes annually. And we supply milk to our local co-op. Um, we have independent beekeepers on farm. And yeah, we're just looking to diversify more and scale up um, silver pasture and um, agroforestry. We see huge potential. Area. Fantastic. Yeah. That's 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 really helpful. Thanks so much, everybody. That's a really good starting point. Now, Richard, you've been, uh, as you said, you you know, you've been organic or thereabouts for twenty odd years, and you've told me that as an organic farmer, originally you looked at regenerative farming in a bit of a snobby way. And I wonder, what do you mean by that? What was a snobby way, and what changed for you? Yeah. Um, 
I think it's because organic, uh, it's, it's a very, um, you know, there's a procedure to follow. There's a conversion period. There's a set of standards that you have to meet. You're, you're inspected quite rigorously every year. Um, so, you know, this regenerative turn came along with, with quite a lot of actually crossover with organic. And I sort of thought, well, you know, are they, are they trying to un undercut? Is this going to undercut organic? And, but, you know, I'm, I, I, I have quite an inquiring mind. I, I, you know, I'm always up for doing research. And, and once I got to looking into it, I realized that it actually complemented what we were doing very well and actually allowed me to take the sort of next step, if you like, from, from where I was with my organic farming. So it perhaps started off as a, as a fear of competition, um, that there were sort of these young upstarts who were coming in with their new way of doing things and, uh, and, and organic was perfectly good. And there was a, perhaps a fear that it was going to undercut the market to an extent? Possibly. I and mean, that's the thing with organic. It's a, it allows me to access a, a higher value market and, and those people that are buying those products, uh, you know, they're guaranteed um, the uh, standards and the production system. Um, regenerative, though, I, I feel is, is, it allows people to come in at all sorts of different entry levels and, uh, and then as, as they get more uh, confident, they can then sort of move up, move up through whether they become, we convert to organic, it all depends on, you know, the market that they might be aiming for. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was it was quite a gradual change for you. It wasn't like you sort of woke up one morning having had a revelation in a dream and thought, no, I, I'm, I'm going to go. Ro I'm going to I'm going to be regenerative now. It was something more gradual. It was definitely more gradual. It was a, a uh, well, it, there was a bit of a light bulb moment. Um, I did a holistic management course and, and that was that was the, that was really the start of the uh, start of the journey. Well, that's a, a good segue, really, because Annabelle, you, you, uh, you've also done the holistic management course. But I wonder, from your perspective, what was it that made you want to become regenerative in the first place? And why was it so important for you to make the transition? Yes, uh, the reason is I was in a crisis. So uh, and, and my my opinion was that the status quo was no option anymore for us. So the story begins uh, um, in 2013 when we leased the farm. From the beginning, we were struggling with the agricultural uh, circumstances. So we really have poor growing conditions and uh, especially the water cycle is really uh, difficult to improve. So, and we have sandy soils, it's with low organic matter. If seven days, no rain and, and sun, the grass will stop to grow. So uh, yes, it's no wonder that all the farmers around us, uh, they started already 50 years ago to, to build irrigation systems. So, and we also, we built an irrigation system and we tried to really to improve circular farming and, uh, but we had a low stocking rate and we still have a low stocking rate and uh, the fertilizer, the manure is always the limitating factor for us. So, and we started to, to make a strong marketing. We, we started the community supported agriculture that um, yes, enables a high stability. And um, so we created the own processing, the own creamery. And um, so we have a high diversity of products. And uh, yes, we did our basic assumption was when we work hard, we will fix it, we will win. <laughs> <laughs> just work hard and everything will um, go in the in the right direction and we thought organic is king it's the solution and so we used all our tools that that we knew to um, to improve the the growing situation and then in 2018 we were in a real drought that was really dramatic for us so we, for the vegetables, we had irrigation. For the arable crops, we had to take decisions what to maintain and what to give up. And uh, for the grasslands, there was no technical solution. And uh, we felt like we were victims of the drought and uh, it was psychological, really dramatic for us. 
And that was um, the time where I had a different perspective because I was out of the daily work. I had born our second child and with a baby, I was walking around. I saw everything and I asked myself, myself, what are we doing here? I don't see any perspective for the next 30 years here in this area with this farm. So um, this was a kick in my ass <laughs> and um, I became open-minded and I took in account that I could be wrong. So, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> That's a really, really, <laughs> really good description. We'll, we'll go into some of that in a bit more detail and, and uh, a little bit later. And I, I just wanted to pick up on that community supported agriculture thing, because it's probably a term that other people won't necessarily uh, understand. So what it essentially means, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, is that you have a fixed group of customers that you're supplying for and there are fixed prices. And I think you said to me before that basically everything you grow has already effectively been sold because of that relatively new piece of legislation in Germany. Yes, it's true. Yes. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. And Blake, you were the first dairy farmer to actually be certified regenerative in the United States. And I wonder how important that certification has been for you in terms of selling your product and making your case, demonstrating your regenerative uh, nature to customers. Yeah, I, I think I should back up to, you know, really um, 30 years ago when, when Stephanie and I bought our, our main ranch, um, which was an expansion away from our, our families, um, we, we really got into building organic matter and soil and paying attention. And we've always been grazers for generations. And so, so we were building organic matter and then along came a market for organic milk. And so 25 years ago, we, we decided to, you know, venture into that because we wanted to create a, a future for our kids that was, um, you know, probably more profitable and, and kind of, in a sense, we were chasing that, that market. Um, and then, much like Richard was saying, and then along came this new word, uh, regenerative, here a few years ago. And we asked our daughter to participate as a pilot program uh, with a couple of the groups that were certifying um regenerative farms uh, nationwide. And so at that point, we then, uh, two years ago, we're launching a, a couple of fluid items nationally and, and Whole Foods, the, the large retailer here of uh, natural products asked us for a, a certification. They said, hey, you, you say you're regenerative, but you know, do you have anything to prove it? And so we went to the Savory Group, Land to Market, and asked for their uh, verification program. And they gave us a you know, a document. And at the same time, we were working with the Regenerative Organic Alliance, and they also gave us a document. So we became the very, the very first uh, certified and verified uh, farm in the United States by both of those groups. And it really wasn't, uh, you know, a goal that we had set out to do, it just kind of happened and, and the timing worked in our favor. Um, and, and I believe that it has opened up a lot of doors for us, uh, you know, doors literally to, to this panel today. And we've done a lot of uh, interviews, a lot of podcasts, um, and certainly retailers and consumers are, are uh, really resonating with the word regenerative. And, um, you know, I, I would like to just give you my, my take on what I believe the word means and, and how it, how it um, kind of resonates in, in our world. Um, you know, first we're, we're Christians and, and uh, you know, so we, we kind of have always paid attention to some biblical principles and, um, and I believe that this term regenerative is just absolutely farming in harmony with, uh, with, with God and, and our nature and, uh, you know, our creator, if you will, um, and, and paying attention to the system that we've been, uh, that has been designed for us. And, and so, as a farmer now, I just uh, simply pay attention to that, and, and, and I'm fully aware of the biology and the soil, and, and, and my job is to do no harm and, and to feed them and help them do, wet, do better so that, uh, you know, our plants and our animals eventually do better and our yields go up, and so that's, that's what it means to me right now, and also, you know, we're sequestering carbon at a pretty fast rate. It's part of the solution to global warming and, and climate change and all the concerns that a lot of people have. And so it's been a really nice uh, word or concept to help summarize that entire story. 
Fantastic. I, I love the idea that, you know, you were effectively over the course of the 30 years, you were already regenerative and that partly yeah. through that kind of biblical spirituality, you were already starting to pay attention to the biology, perhaps in a way that some other people around you weren't. But the name regenerative and society has sort of caught up with you um, as as you've gone along. And that's uh, that's that's really interesting. Mark, like many, your transition to regenerative dairy, and like Annabelle, grew out of crisis, and yours was a financial crisis. And I wonder if you could talk to us about why it was that you began to make the transition. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I guess it was financial, but also there was there were other there were many other tension events that that, that came together. Um, we seem to have this mindset drilled into us at young ages that we must get bigger or, or get out. And that that kind of mechanistic mentality values kind of possessions and stuff more than experience and, and kind of wisdom or knowledge. And it's almost an inbuilt story that we have told ourselves. Um, we got caught up in that story, <laughs> um, and and we peaked we peaked about nine fifty milking cows twice a day, but we were faced with with low milk payouts, consecutive dry seasons. We had we had a couple of quite bad droughts, um, and I also had a health scare and and autoimmune disease, um, and at that time we were employing contract milkers and, and the focus really with, with that system in New Zealand is um, production at, at all costs. Um, and chasing this production was, was putting a large strain on the land and, and the people and the animals. And um, yeah, the farm had, had become more of a machine than a living system, I think. and. Um, yeah, we just started to ask more questions. We read more, we, we met new people. Um, we researched principles of permaculture and, and, and regenerative agriculture. Um, yeah, when I, had the, when I was ill, I, I realized that the farm was like a mirror image of, of the farmer itself. Um, you know, the farm was losing soil, we were losing nitrate, um, animal health was poor and chemical use had increased. So I really um, took a look in the mirror and um, asked, asked the hard questions. Um, once we gained that knowledge and we, we wrapped some support people around us, that, that kind of gave us the confidence to move forward in, in, a, in a new system. And, and I guess that's when we started to rapidly remove winter cropping and tillage and and, uh, and move to just bale grazing and, and tall pasture for wintering. Um, we moved very fast to take synthetic nitrogen out of the system and today we make compost. Um, and then we implemented mob grazing to into the once a day milking system. So we made many changes. We had, we had Ian Mitchell in this visit the farm and that was kind of a pivotal moment for, for our learning. Uh, we also removed in, in, in shared uh, grain feeding um, and we really redefined what success looks like um, with a kind of 100 to 200 year vision. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I'm really interested in the way in which, um, you know, it, it kind of almost by accident, it's turned out that the, the people that we have on the panel today really reflect uh, my experience of talking to regenerative dairy farmers across the last six months. So we've got um, yourself, Mark and Annabelle, and you know, you, you talked about tension events and I was asking Annabelle about crisis and she was talking about, you know, droughts and and, and for an awful lot of farmers who've become regenerative, it's because they've kind of somehow 
hit rock bottom or they've hit a crisis or they've hit a series of tension events, as you as you guys have said. Um, and and it seems that doing things very differently has been the only way out. And then we've got, um, you know, a group of farmers like Blake, who essentially have have always been doing this and society's kind of caught up with that. And then people like Richard, who've been you know struggling and trying to do the right thing in various different certification schemes and have gradually come to the conclusion that the regenerative way of doing things just works best for them. So it's it's a really interesting mix. And Annabelle, I wonder if I could come back to you. When you decided to transition, I remember that you struggled to convince your partner that this was a good idea. And, uh, and, and I wonder if you could tell us what he said and, and what happened next. <laughs> so, yes, um, I, we needed really a shift in, in the mindset. So, um, and this, this shift for me was like a revolution in my head. And my revolution took part one or two years before his revolution in his head took part. So I was just, yeah, I began to, to with this uh, thoughts, but um, yes. And then, then I, um, I did the basic course, holistic management and holistic plant grazing. And in spring 2020, I told my husband that I want to do holistic plant grazing with two of our herds. And um, he, um, yes, he, he, he did not see a sense in it. And he was really critical. His critical points were who will gonna do the work so there will be a lot of fencing. We don't have the water infrastructure. And uh, how can I mow or mulch? How can I, can I control the weeds and everything? So we will have much more work and for what? So he said, you can do that, but you will do it alone. And then I did it alone. And it took uh, about four months. And then uh, we were both convinced because we, we saw the effects, uh, maybe not for an outstanding person, but for us, um, we, we, we know the, the, the land for years and we know our struggle and our, our problems with, with the grassland. And so we, we both saw the effects. And then, um, yes, we started to continue our way together and now it's a strong part of our relationship and it's it's a shift from from struggling and fighting against a lot of things to more to use the power and and the processes of nature to to create stability and resilience so for example uh, at first we 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 thought the milk yield has to be 6500 liters per cow so that was our goal. And um, now it's just uh, the question, how can we best integrate our cows, our cattle in the, in the ecosystem processes? How can we best integrate them? And then yes, we will harvest milk and we have to see how much milk is it? So the, yeah. That's it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Blake, I'd like to think about scale for a moment. And the scale of your business is significantly larger than many of the other regenerative dairy businesses that we found. What do you think it is that's enabled you to succeed at scale? Yeah, so um, I think the, the question of whether we've succeeded at scale is still yet to be answered. So we're uh, still working on that. It's, it's a struggle. Um, uh, I, I think it's important that I, I just point out, I grew up on a 150 acre farm uh, with, a, with 150 cows here in, in Ferndale and Humboldt County. And, um, you know, I've just been very, very aggressive uh, and I've kind of dragged my wife along uh, that path and eventually our kids have helped a lot. And so, um, you know, we, we just grew and grew because there we were the very first organic uh, dairy farm in our region. and. And there was a, a, a lot of need for that 20 years ago. And so we just had a milk supply or milk market that was asking for more supply. And then, then things went on a down cycle and neighbors started to go out. And so their land became available. And, and that's when we stepped in because um, you know, we, we could always use more, more grass. And, and that's, that's kind of how we grew. 
um, you know, to, to be at the scale that we're at, um, it, it, it really comes naturally. We, we also get a lot of rain here, uh, 45 inches here in Humboldt County, but about 80 to 90 or even 100 inches of rainfall uh, in Delmar County, where the majority of our cows are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's extremely wet, much like uh, I think the, the climates and environments that, uh, you know, New, New Zealand and maybe Richard's in. Um, and so uh, it, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun because as we get better and better at being regenerative, uh, you know, yields go up. And, and that's the message that I tend to give to my con conventional neighbors or conventional farmers across the United States is that I believe that everybody should look at the principles involved here and, and pay attention to the soil biology and, and um, you know, the roots and the plants and the benefit that uh, happens when you keep um, basically your your, your land covered with plants and, and certainly green plants are better than brown plants, uh, but everything is better than bare soil. And so that's, that's the message. Fantastic. Um, I'm realizing that we're about halfway through the questions that I wanted to ask you, um, and uh, and we're we're more than halfway through the, uh, the this the time that we have. So I'm going to try and speed up a little bit and not ask too many supplementaries. But Mark, thinking about the bigger picture, why is a regenerative transformation so important? Important, do you think for the global dairy sector and also how do you measure regeneration on your farm? Well that first one's a pretty big question. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's very important in many ways. Um, uh, one would be decoupling of, of the of the externalized costs or damage caused by the current model. Um, uh, here we're trying to internalize those costs now um, and as a large industry I think we need to reduce our dependence on energy along with most fertilizer inputs um, some of which are already past peak supply um, yeah these inputs are non-renewable <laughs> that means our current trajectory is not sustainable and um, sustainability is a byproduct of regeneration so it's it's in our best interest to um move in this direction i i feel um yeah well, i think we'll need more people on the land um yeah for example we now need more people in our system with scaling our own fertility program so with our compost um so it's, it's, it's a lot of talk about um, less production and less, less people needed, but actually it's, it's the opposite once you start layering more perenniality into your system, whether that's fruit and nuts, um, vertical grazing, silver pasture, etc. cetera. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, the, the systems have gone so far mono I, th I think it'll be like a large restoration phase um, leading into regeneration. Um, and, and yeah, that'll be, that'll be not so much land use change, but um, layering diversity back into our system to make it more, more resilient. Um, and I, I believe it's also really important for local food security, you know, if, um, food security is linked to soil security. So we need to nurture our soil, look after our soil, and that's the base from there we, we build from there. Um, and I think once you once you are starting to move in the, or, or most regenerative practitioners are thinking this way, they're thinking, how can we lay our complexity back into the landscape? Um, um, how can we increase biodiversity um, and, and make our system um, more resilient. Fantastic. And so you're seeing the regenerative change. And I think also you've got university students coming onto the farm, you know, monitoring various different things. I think you, you were having some super high worm counts uh, when we spoke to you for one of the podcasts and people can listen to a bit more about your system in, uh, in the podcast on the Farmgate channel. Richard, how has your approach to farming changed since you decided to adopt those regenerative principles? Yeah, well, I, I, as I said, I, I did the holistic management course, and uh, and there's the three principles there. This 
of a decision making process. You know, there's, there's the social, the, the environmental, and the economic are the three things that you need to consider with it, with, it, with every decision. And um, but on the land, I was um, sort of, I guess I got in a bit of a rut. You know, how how can I implement those things that I'd learned? You know, that the holistic plan grazing the all, all those really good things um you know i was able to read the land uh, i was able to see that i had problems i had bare soil i had uh you know water not not um getting away quickly enough um i had weeds coming we have a, a the docking you know is a, is a is a is a big weed for us and it was how i could move on and really the re regenerative uh principles uh that i've adopted as uh in, in a relatively short space of time you know literally literally a, a couple of years uh we're, we're, we're moving forward so we're moving more towards the uh taller grass grazing which is a, a challenge for or a challenge for me anyway i think for dairy farmers because you just worry about you're going to lose that uh quality that you need uh have much more diversity in the uh, passage than i had before and that's either coming back or i'm I'm introducing that when, I, when I'm doing uh, any reseeding. And I'm also introducing that into the silage as well. We, we house the cows, <coughs> we house the cows during the winter. So we're feeding um, silage and with more diversity. So that's, that's benefiting things. Um, the, the slurry uh, is, a, is a one that, I, I'm, you know, the, all, all the composting and stuff. I mean, at the moment, you know, we have a lot of work to do there, but there's there's different people doing different things. And I think that's, you know, that's all part of this great journey that, you know, there are some people that are further ahead than, than you are. And, you're, you know, I'm perhaps further ahead than others. And, you know, we're all learning off each other. It's really good. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it, that knowledge sharing element of regenerative seems to be really exciting. And I think, you know, it's it's partly when organic you know, was first developed, I guess, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have the social media and, you know, these sorts of opportunities that we do now, whereas regenerative kind of has a, you know, a head start in that way. Blake, you know, I, <laughs> you've been doing this for a long time. And I wonder when you're talking about why you do what you do to conventional farmers, what do you say to convince them that regenerative dairy is also good business dairy? Yes, it's uh, along the lines of what I was Speaking about a few minutes ago, it, it, it I I believe it totally increases yields, and, and we certainly have diminishing diminishing returns on fertilizers, and so folks that are growing um, basically corn and soybeans across the United States, um, you know, those are the two primary cash crops. You know, every year they've got to use more fertilizer to grow the same yield, and and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get the same yield that they got last year, and and so. To me, that that's a, a perfect example of how um, you know some of those commercial fertilizers are harming the biology, and so it's you know it might be two steps forward, one step back, and and we need to you know they need to pay attention to that. And so again, I tell the farmers to pay attention to some of the principles. They don't have to switch churches and religions all at the same time. I'm not asking them to go certified organic or anything like that. They can uh, certainly pay attention to these regenerative principles and kind of honor that soil system, if you will, and um, I believe make their farm more profitable. And it, it's a it's a long term effect. Um, there was a question here on the side that you know uh, what have we noticed in our soils? And and I guess I'd like to say that you know 30 years ago we started paying attention to building organic matter, and so on our primary farm at home. We've gone from two or three percent organic matter in the soil to eight to fifteen now, and and it's crazy. Uh, that's just a tremendous growth, and so I think of it as in our uh, our farm is literally getting one inch taller every decade or something, and we are doing everything we can to haul in uh, fish waste uh, from the coast. Uh, we bring in a lot of wood chips from the the lumber mills. And then of course our manures and we are composting as much as we can and trying to spread that out on about 25% of our farm every year and just uh, rotate that around. Um, nothing scientific, we just drive by and if it looks like it, it made the low, low end of the list, we, we run with that. It, it's really a, a simple program. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was that, um, you know, kind of, I guess for Annabella, we, 
our favorite breed of cows, we use all um, crossbreed cows, but we're using the Bavarian Fleck V, which is a German breed and uh, dual purpose. Um, I heard Mark mention that. And um, we absolutely are in love with those cows. And so the majority of our animals are all a uh, Fleck V cross. And uh, we also focus on the A2 uh, protein. And so everything we sell is A2 milk, organic Blake, version of that. Blake, even without knowing that you've, you've just performed the perfect segue because you're talking yeah. about your breed. And I wanted to ask Richard next about, about genetics because it's something that you've worked hard on, Richard, over the last 20 years. And I wonder how important this has been in terms of your success across that time and particularly for your regenerative approach now. Yeah, I, I would start crossbreeding probably 20 odd years ago. Um, and um, my uh, philosophy then, and it still is now, is that the cow, uh, the cow changes um, to the farm to suit the farm, and not the other way around. I, I was on a, a treadmill before of changing the farming system to suit the cow, and um, and now it's definitely the other way around, and it's brought uh, a lot of benefits. We we block calve in the autumn. Um, we, 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 well, we're three quarters of the way through uh, calving now, and it's just, you know, they, they calve easily, uh, they're healthy, we have very, very little mastitis, we haven't used any antibiotics for two years, we have very good fit, uh, fertility. The buildings that we have are, aren't, certainly aren't very modern, but the cows are, for the house period are happy, uh, happy in those and perform, uh, perform well. And the, my feeding system is, is, very, is very simple, and I just select the best, uh, the cows that are performing the best are the ones that I breed from. And um, it's, um, you know, it, for, for, for each generation, I'm, I'm seeing an improvement. And I use, um, I've sort of pretty much stuck with the uh, Scandinavian red, the, the Holstein and the Montbelliard, and I put a little bit of Jersey in there now and again, but those, those are the breeds that, that suit me. And I have tried, you know, some of those other breeds, but uh, I've just found that those breeds suit to suit this farm the best. Fantastic. I'm noticing that quite a few people are sticking some questions in the Q&A section. If, you, if there are questions for the panel, if you could pop them in the chat, that'd be helpful. But if the panel, when they're not talking, can have a look at the Q&A, because there are a few quite specific questions in there that I think you might be able to answer by uh, by typing rather than uh, necessarily within the, the audience Q&A at the end. We've just got another couple of questions before we go into that Q&A. And Annabelle, while regenerative agriculture is becoming quite well known, really, for farmers in Britain, it's, you know, it's in the media quite a lot now, as well as in the USA and in New Zealand, it's a much newer concept in Germany. And I wonder why that is and how difficult it's been for you to find information to support your own transition. Yes, it's, it's really an, uh, an interesting question. And um, yes, concerning regenerative agriculture, we are a kind of developing country. <laughs> so, uh, and especially for region uh, dairy, uh, there's, yeah, there are no farmers at all, as I know. So uh, what is the reason? What are the reasons? I don't know, really. One could be the language because um, a lot of farmers, they don't speak that good English. And uh, for me, the regenerative agriculture seems really practical driven or uh, a bottom up process. So the farmers have to think how to change their practice. And so they, have, they need access to the information or to, yeah. In, they have to get inspiration about uh, different ways of farming. So maybe the language is one problem and maybe our agricultural system, because we are uh, a country of wealth, we are, we, we face, the, yes, we face the, the planetary boundaries, but we are addicted by fossil fuels. We have, um, yes, high technical standards, high energy input. And our climate usually is quite moderate. Actually, it's changing. And uh, the European policies, they try to protect farmers and um, maybe they don't, um, yes, they, they protect the system that is not regenerative. So, and I think um, as more crisis we will have, as more regenerative agriculture will um, start, will, will grow. So um, 
but at the moment there's no authority that recommends regenerative agriculture and um Yes, because yes, it's also it's a long term perspective, and at the moment we are we are farming small, a uh, uh, short term, short term, uh, uh, yeah, farming. <laughs> so yeah. And that language thing is is of course critically important. We were talking earlier on about the importance of social media and you know the importance of webinars like this for sharing information. And of course, almost all of the information that you've had to find for yourself has been in English. So you've had to be able to you know you're in in the strong position where you're able to understand English well enough that you can benefit from that. But of course, an awful lot of farmers you know primarily speak German if they speak any English at all. So there's a real need for information in the German language and presumably across Europe in France. French and Spanish and, and those sorts of yeah. things as well. Um, lots of lots of work to do there in the future. And Mark, just finally, before we go to the audience, I want to talk about the big issue. <laughs> Again, you're getting lots of big issues uh, of greenwash, the idea of companies making grander claims than they're able to deliver. And I wonder how significant you think the threat of greenwash is for individual farmers and for the dairy sector more broadly. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Um, I think there's there's the gates are open really. Um, I think that with anything there's potential for for greenwash or to mislead or, or present false information to our potential eaters. Um, yeah, I guess at the farm level we we are in control, so um, we're in control of that story until it leaves the gate. Um, if 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 you want to sell direct to the eater um then you better be true to your word uh, and transparent because eventually you'll 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 be found out or exposed i guess um and and that goes for middle industry too um so the threat of greenwash is large um, and real um and the backlash from a more conscious eater is is very large i, I would presume um, and, and we're in this agriculture, we're in this for many generations and we're in it for the long game. So we, we don't want to do something in our nest that we, we wouldn't go and sit in. Yeah. Um, I guess on, on our farm, we can now map the five or six years of third party data via what was originally Integrity Soils and now Michael Cashmore. And we can showcase that. Um, we can showcase our regenerativity and how that's progressing over time. Um, how our worm counts have been increasing. How our soil organic matter, our rooting depth, our water infiltration. So we can we can now map that and present that. Um, I mean, I I do I value the outcomes based monitoring. Um, that that really aligns with ecological improvements um like what Blake was talking about the the eov or the savory institute is is a good one i feel um because it's independent um it's probably recognized um and holds integrity we need for the future um i think I think for a sector, we need animals back on pasture. We need them back on land, mimicking nature. Um, I love the idea of living barns, which are trees, more trees in the landscape, um, less concrete, um, improving our soil to the point where we can hold our animals on the on the soil for more of the year. Um, and yeah, I guess it's. It's a real challenge, especially for high input dairy. Um, and I see the greenwash setting in pretty fast. <laughs> um, I guess the, the regeneration is built on indigenous wisdom and, and, you know, these methods of farming that are traditional. So it's, it's, we need to take that with the latest science and 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 move forward from there i guess yeah lovely but thanks so much. yeah 
yeah thanks thanks so much mark um we're, we're going to leave it there in terms of uh, in terms of my questions and turn to the uh, the audience just for a moment so thanks so much everyone i think it's been a fascinating conversation so far i've just put a, a link into the uh into the chat box there and i just want to mention before we um go into the questions about our regen dairy farmer survey and, and i'd like to ask you if you have any contact with dairy farmers at all if you're a dairy farmer yourself uh, to please share it with your contacts and fill it in. It's a really important part of our research in the Regen Dairy, uh, Regen Dairy project. We need responses from as many dairy farmers as possible, including from conventional farmers who are perhaps more skeptical about regenerative dairy and regen agriculture more broadly. Getting an understanding of all farmer perspectives we think is really important. And so this is a fantastic opportunity really through the survey uh, to inform both the project and also the future direction uh, of Regen Dairy, certainly in the, in the minds of the, the companies that we're working Working with on this, so I've got a few um, you've, a few questions. Uh, oh, and also, if you go to the um, if you miss the link here, if you go to the regendairy.org website, then you'll find it the survey at the top right um, there. So, to the questions, this is sort of building on a question that came in earlier, um, Blake, around where you were talking about an inch of uh, soil organic matter a decade. You were talking about the amount of sequestration that you're getting in your soil, and I wonder how long do you think that sequestration will carry on for? Do you think it'll carry on in Definitely, or is it is it sort of over a finite period? As far as I understand, at this point, um, it will carry on, um, and you know, organic matter converts down to humus and humates, and and uh, you know, it becomes part of the soil stability. And so, uh, I don't know if there's a limiting factor. I don't believe there is at all. We just keep adding on and on, and and, and it gets taller and bigger and better. And so, uh, I see it as a uh, um, you know, a, a long, long term solution. I think you've already answered this question as well, Blake. It's another one for you um, in the in the chat. But just to give you the opportunity to go into a bit more detail, is regenerative agriculture a protected legal term in the US is the question. And then mm -hmm. there's a sort of supplementary there about how many certification schemes uh, for regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture exist and, and are any of them dairy specific? Yeah, nothing dairy specific for Regen at this point. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's the two that we participate in. They were the first two here. There's a couple new ones now. And, um, you know, I, I think that greenwashing is absolutely real. I don't know exactly, um, you know, whether to really hate it or to just feel bad about it, because at least it gets people talking about it and the concepts eventually work out. But um, you know, I think it's important for us farmers to always remind everybody this this does need to start at the ground up. And I've talked to large retailers and, and you know, world, I, I guess, uh, well, Danone, let's put it that way, and, and told them that, you know, you know, I, I don't want to speak to their farmers unless it's coming from farmer to farmer. I don't want to educate Danone to go out and preach from the top down. This is absolutely a bottom up and a ground up uh, movement, and it needs to maintain that so that we have integrity. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think that this is the solution to our, our global crisis that we uh, tend to all have in, in developing countries and um, emerging countries. And so, you know, I, I think it's here to stay and, and yeah, we can just keep sequestering more and more carbon. Thanks so much. I, I've got a, a, a comment really here, uh, and perhaps people can take this offline, but I'll be interested to know. It says, Finlow looks nothing like I thought in my head. I, I wonder what people thought I would look like, but uh, maybe that's one that, that people can send me uh, in, due, in due course. There's a, a more specific question here, um, uh, and you know, open to everybody, uh, anybody that wants to take it on. And it's, it's I guess, looking at the, uh, the conflict between how we make environmental progress at the same time as how do we protect farm animal health and welfare. And so this is from Ryan. It says, I'm curious of everyone's worming policies. Do you all vaccinate for lungworm, for example, to minimize the use of ivermectins, which are the most harmful to soil biology? Um, is this something that, uh, that any of you have particularly thought about and would like to have a quick comment on? I'm looking perhaps at Richard in the first instance to have yeah. a go at that one. Yeah, I, uh, I, can, uh, I can answer that. Yeah, so we don't use any, we haven't used any ivermectins. That they're not allowed in uh, organic systems. Uh, anyway, um, we haven't, we don't use any wormers um, during the grazing season, and we do uh, regular uh, fecal egg counts to, to monitor those. Um, we do vaccinate for uh, lungworm, and we, 
and, and then we'll monitor fluke as well. But we found that with the uh, rotational grazing, particularly the, the slightly longer rotations that we're now, we've now adopted to uh, with the taller grass grazing, you know, that sort of 30 plus days, that's, that's certainly breaking that cycle, especially with the, you know, the younger, uh, younger cattle. Uh, just weighed in the other day, actually, so it's very timely. You know, we, 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 we were targeting 320 kilos at 12 months, and we, we were averaged 355. So, you know, really pleased with that um, that result. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, I'm going to go on for another five or ten minutes because we've got a, you know a few questions coming in. I'll, I'll cut it at, at ten. Um, this is a question from Lottie, and it says, and maybe. Annabelle, this is a good one for you, because when we spoke and you said, you know, you've come from the conventional world into the world that you are now and that that perhaps gives you a bit of an insight into how, you know, how conventional farmers continue to think. And so the question is, what would you say is the biggest barrier for a conventional farmer looking uh, to move towards regenerative practices? So I... I didn't come from the conventional uh, farming. I, I came from organic farming, <laughs> but maybe it's the same <laughs> somehow. Um, I think uh, a lot of farmers um, think never change a running system. So if you have something that works, then you will continue. So really for me, it was necessary to be in a crisis. To, to be, to, yeah, to accept that I maybe that I'm wrong. So that is, and, and yeah, it's a process that you have to do by yourself. So nobody can, can just uh, force you to do that. It's, it's something you have to do by your own. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And a question perhaps that Mark, you could have a go at, because um, I think you've touched on uh, some of these elements. And the question is, to what extent do the panelists see regenerative agriculture practices going beyond the benefits of carbon sequestration by adding mitigation potential of nature-based solutions in the water cycle? So I guess the question is around, you know, that sort of climate change adaptation and mitigation, but that biodiversity increase and the managing of the soil carbon sponge as well. Well, good question. Um, I guess here we, we're now seeing that, yeah, there's a lot of talk about carbon tunnel vision and people focusing in just on, on carbon. So um, we think um, increasing um, carbon at all trophic levels, like um, I'm talking soil, pasture, trees, animals, the birds, these are all carbon-based elements. So just just focusing in on one is, is not not good enough, I don't think. Um, it's a it's a system within systems. And um, yeah, that's that's how we can can really tap into increasing biodiversity and and really pulling back on some of these inputs or um, crutches that we've held on to for for a long time increased biodiversity will will increase our resilience and and help us you know get off some of these these um external um inputs that are having having some some kind of well pretty negative effects to be honest yeah does that answer yeah, 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 absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a, a question for all of you and, uh, and maybe just, you know, jump in if you if you want to have a go. And I guess the question is about um, the way in which we actually enable empower farmers and empower customers to make that regenerative transition because it's all very well for farmers to say they want to change but if especially if they're selling into larger cooperatives um you know such as some of our partners like Arla or down in New Zealand into Fonterra then there's the responsibility from the company to lead from the top to an extent as well and often you know it's quite difficult particularly for some of the middle managers within those companies because that direction needs to come from the bottom and from the top and, and sometimes those companies get stuck in the middle a bit. So the question is uh, for Mal, could companies who farmers sell their milk to not be instrumental to help share and spread regenerate, uh, regenerative agriculture knowledge? And I wonder how you think they might do that? Yeah, I, I, I can start on that. Um, 
I, I, I mentioned Whole Foods. Uh, the, they're a large retailer here with over 500 stores in the United States, and they're certainly the leading um, retailer of natural foods. And you know, they have absolutely embraced uh, what we do as regenerative farmers. And um, they're, they're kind of putting their mouth, money where their mouth is in, in that regard. And I think that other companies will follow um, along that line. Um, I'd also like to maybe just touch back. I, I was sitting here thinking uh, to one of the other questions about, you know, this regenerative and how long can we, you know, keep it up. I just want to remind everybody that all of our ancestors going back for thousands of years have been regenerative farmers. And we get all wrapped up in this weird conventional versus organic versus now regenerative. And well, I'm just saying regenerative is back to full circle what our great, great grandfathers were doing in, in a, another era and, and before synthetic fertilizers and, and other things. And, and, you know, we just have a whole lot more awareness of the biology and, and the understanding and the, the relationship and the symbiotic relationship between roots and, and, and critters in the soil. So that, that's, that's the answer to how long term this is and how sustainable it is. Thanks so much. I'm going to do uh, one more question before we finish. And uh, and it comes really from a comment that somebody was making within the chat uh, rather than a, a specific question from the chat. And it's around the role of financial institutions. Um, obviously, the, you know, a range of different partners in farming. There's the farmer, there's the company you're selling to, there's the customer. But very often financial institutions are really important in terms of understanding what it is you're trying to do and therefore um, to understand what it is that they're lending against. And I wonder if anybody has any experience of... Um, of financial institutions getting better at understanding regenerative agriculture. Um, Mark, I think you have a reasonable relationship with your bank. But we also have some connectivity issues um, going She's across. Been, uh, there you go. Uh, thanks. Our bank manager has just um, retired, actually. <laughs> so um, our bank manager has just retired. She was with us for 16 years, and she really understood what we were aiming for. Um, so, so yeah, as long as you, you you explain that well to your financial aid out on the table, it's 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 your life. You 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 it's your pathway. So. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of what we did in the end, and um, things are things are turning around, things are coming together. Anybody else got any experiences to share, good or bad, in terms of financial institutions? Well, in, in my opinion, they all talk the talk, but they don't walk it. And and, um, and you know, one of my one of my major banks is Rabo Bank out of the Netherlands, and uh, you know, we're just struggling with them. Um, but yet, they have all the sustainability um, statements. I, I was asked to speak last year at a group called Sustainable Brands, and so if you can just envision every company you can ever think of, they have a sustainability department, then they send the, the leads and those people to this, uh, this conference that I, I was speaking at for like three minutes. And, you know, they they, um, the, the largest company that I could, I could see like 30 employees there was Shell Oil. And, and so, you know, they, they're, um, they're all jumping into the bandwagon, but, uh, you know, it's a long way from the farm and the actual farmers. And so I, I don't know how we solve that. I, I'm just doing it one acre at a time, you know, from my perspective and telling the story when, whenever, if anyone will listen. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, go, go on, Mark. One last thought. Uh, there's um, businesses or corporations in New Zealand are now um, or, or about to have to um, produce climate risk disclosures. So this is going to put some heat on on that industry. So um, yeah, we may see some some good changes come from that. Just to yeah. add that. Okay, that's great. That's it. 
that's all we have time for. So our round the world tour has come to an end and I'd like to thank our panelists who I think have just been fantastic. It's a shame on Zoom, you don't get to give a round of applause, but you, you know, I, I think they deserve an enormous round of applause for the work they've done this evening. Uh, so I'd like to thank them, Annabelle Girard from Germany, Mark Anderson from New Zealand, Richard Park from the UK, and Blake Alexander from the USA. And thank you too for joining us for your comments and questions. And can I please remind you again about the Regen Dairy Survey, which is for all dairy farmers, not just Regen Dairy farmers, on our website, regendairy.org. Thanks so much. I've been Finlow Costain. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks.